Hey, and welcome back. This is Mr. Arvias with another coronavirus history lesson. This one's a U.S. history lesson about the Nazi war in Western Europe. And so we're talking 1940 Nazi invasion of Denmark, of the Netherlands, of Belgium, and then, of course, of France. And so throughout this lesson, uh, we'll hope to kind of dispel some of the misnomers that some people have about this invasion, particularly about the French military at the time. Uh, but we'll also kind of be looking a little bit about what Germany did that made it so effective. And then also... What's the American reaction to this? How are we looking at this uh, You know, w w when it all occurs? And I think that's really, really important to understand. Americans were very shocked by all of this. We thought it was going to be a long war and it ends up being very short. So without further ado, let's just get started. When we last left off, the Germans had invaded Poland successfully. The Russians also invaded Poland at the end of September. And so that part of the war is over effectively, though the occupation is just beginning. And we know how that's going to be so horrible for the Polish people. Now, in America, we looked at the French-British de declaration of war on the Germans as the phony war. And that's because the French really didn't do anything. And the British were just amassing soldiers and airplanes and naval vessels all off the coast of Europe. But the French really hadn't invaded. They had a couple little border skirmishes with the Germans. None of them went particularly well for the French. And so here we go. And the French are sitting there now thinking the Maginot Line, this big fortified uh, position that they put in the German-French border is going to protect them. Now, it it's also also kind of spotty protection right along the border of Belgium, which is ironic because if you think about the Germans' invasions of France in the past, 1870, 1871, Franco-Prussian War, they invaded through Belgium. World War I, they invaded through Belgium. Now, before you say, oh, look at the French not knowing how to do war. Well, that's sort of true, sort of not true in this scenario. One thing I think you really need to kind of keep in mind is the Ardennes Forest was looked at as impenetrable. And people didn't think that a panzer army, an army based off of tanks, could get through a forest like the Ardennes. And the Germans will. And that's going to be ultimately what surprises the French the most. It's not that they attack. It's not that the speed. It's the fact they went through the Ardennes Forest. And they do so very, very quietly, or at least as quietly as you can, moving thousands of soldiers and panzer tanks. But without further ado, let's talk about the actual invasion. So Hitler kind of lets things calm down from mid-October uh, all the way through January, February, and March. But then in April, that's when these invasions are going to take place. In textbooks, they make them seem like they're all different. But realistically, this is all one giant invasion. Okay, so April of 1940, we see the attacks that are going to take place on Denmark and on Norway. Now, if you don't know where those places are, they're just north of Germany. I always say Denmark is like Germany. Germany's hat. And so when they push into Norway and Denmark, the Germans do something that they hadn't done before. They use paratroopers. So troopers drop from airplanes. Now for the Germans, this was not a, a really positive experience. Paratroopers by nature scatter. They don't always land in their drop zones and they definitely didn't in Denmark and Norway. And the Germans didn't really like that. Now Americans, four years later, right, in the invasion of Normandy will use paratroopers and they like the fact that they don't land everywhere they're supposed to be because it creates mass chaos on the ground and that ultimately is going to be what their job's going to be. But the Germans kind of experiment with paratroopers here and it doesn't really necessarily work out as much. Um, and this is a smaller type of invasion, 125,000 German soldiers involved. Um, now, why do they want Norway? Because they thought Britain was going to get there first. And so Germany is going to cut Britain off because they don't want Brit British to have a, a northern base where they can launch airstrikes against the German people. Now, there's going to be some subsequent other invasions uh, that are going to take place over this as well. Now, the, the big one is going to be the invasion of the Netherlands because this is going to be the first time where you you see the French army, you're going to see the Belgians, you're going to see the British sort of in the invasion of the ne Netherlands. And the invasion of the Netherlands is actually ultra, ultra quick. And so it starts in May of 1940, and it's only going to take place over the course of five days. That's right, five days for that entire country to be taken over. Now, Nor uh, the, the Netherlands decided that they were going to flood a lot of these fields. Remember, the Netherlands is under sea level, so they flood a lot of things. And the Germans are going to use paratroopers. They're also going to make you know makeshift bridges, and they're going to get those panzers in. And it's basically when they threaten to just destroy Rotterdam that the Netherlands ultimately is going to surrender. And, and, and that's going to be kind of a big deal. You know, a lot of these countries don't want to see their capitals destroyed. And Warsaw for a lot of reasons, is an example of what you don't want to happen if you're in these countries. And so that ultimately is going to be what happens with the Netherlands. They're going to surrender in five days. British soldiers and French soldiers are more or less going to stay out of the Netherlands. They do participate a little bit, but for the most part, they're focusing on defending in Belgium, uh, where they're going to kind of have some, some initial pushback. Now, uh, Hitler 
again, is going to be overly confident on this. And a lot of his advisors didn't really want the invasion of France to happen in 1940. A lot of people thought that that would kind of really create um, a problem for the German army. A lot of his generals didn't think they were ready. They didn't think they'd have enough resources. The French army, understand this, is considered to be one of the best armies in the world. And so at the time, it's one of the largest armies in Europe. They have you know, basically just as many planes, just as many tanks. All of that stuff kind of is on an equal playing field. And so when the Germans invade, it's going to be about strategy. It's not necessarily going to be about equipment because the equipment is more or less similar. Now, what the Germans do ultra effective is they coordinate and they don't always do it like this, but they coordinate the the Luftwaffe and the Panzers. And that's going to be really what kind of helps out a lot. Um, the other thing that they did very, very well was they deceptively invaded France. They made France think the invasion was coming from somewhere else. And then they went straight through the Ardennes Forest with Panzer groups. And this is the largest invasion in human history until the Russian front. Uh, all said and done, right, you're talking over 2.8 to 3 million people in invading into, uh, into France. And the French army and the British army both, it, because people sometimes really rag on the French army, the French army really suffers from poor communication. And that's the problem, right? So the French army operated on kind of a top-up command structure where individual commanders really needed command from the generalship to make decisions and reallocate soldiers. And you know that's something that really bogged down communication. They did not invest heavily in coded radio. They still used you know basically wired signals and things of that nature. And so the French are communicating at a much slower rate. And so when the Germans begin to push through, there's an overwhelming sense of failure amongst the French army. Uh, they do fight very well, and they, they do put up a fight in the air. The British, the Royal Air Force, and the French Air Force do put up a fight against the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe is simply larger. Their planes are slightly better, right? A little faster, a little bit better. Um, Keep in mind, about a fourth to two thirds of those planes, the Luftwaffe planes, are going to be shot down or disabled during the French campaign. So, why did people think this would last so long? Well, in World War I, when Germany invaded France, it was a stalemate, right? It was a four-year-long stalemate uh, of a war. And people kind of thought that would happen again. Except this time, when they went through the Ardennes Forest, right, and they came out through Belgium, they completely caught the French by surprise and routed the French. The other thing that happened is when the Germans began to bomb cities, what that did is it created a humanitarian crisis. And so think like, you know, if you're evacuating for a hurricane, okay? You evacuate for a hurricane, everyone's on the the interstate and it creates huge traffic jams. Well, imagine if whole cities are being destroyed by bombings. All these French roads are going to be flooded with civilians. And so the French are not able to mobilize and reallocate soldiers quick enough. Their rail system is also going to be pulverized by the Germans. So the Germans do a very good job of crippling all forms of transportation for the French army. The other thing is that the British were kind of caught off guard a lot too. And they did not have a, a fighting chance because they're going to get more or less surrounded. And so as the, the month of May kind of teeters on, it's just one disaster after another. And we know if you talk about British history, we get Winston Churchill is going to be named prime minister. Obviously, Neville Chamberlain, as we talked about in the previous class, who said that, that there's peace in our time, looks like a moron. And now all of a sudden we have Winston Churchill who comes in and you know he he's kind of that bulldog that Britain needs, but he comes in at the worst possible time. The British army is being routed. They have captures and in, in, in KIAs everywhere. Uh, and they're going to be pinned down. And they're going to be pinned down in a small little uh, port city called Dunn. Kirk. Now, Dunkirk is famous because obviously there was a movie made a couple of years about it, and we could talk a little bit about how that movie's pretty good. It's okay in terms of what it does, though I don't think it shows you the full scope of the Dunkirk evacuation. And, you know, to be honest, the evacuation of Dunkirk of the British Army is probably one of my favorite stories in all of World War II, because when you think about what militaries do and what they do for their civilians, they tend to be the ones who save, right? The military comes in and saves the day. They're the ones who come in and rescue you during natural disasters. But at Dunkirk, you know, Winston Churchill is going to mobilize Britain, right? He's going to mobilize Britain and they're going to take all these different boats, whether they be fishing boats, pleasure boats, you know, cargo containers. They're going to take all these different types of ships and boats and they're going to sail them across the English Channel to help liberate these British soldiers. And the, the actual saving of Dunkirk um, is a loss. Let's be very honest. The British lose the Battle of France and they are removed from that. But the you know the actual evacuation of Dunkirk, which is 340,000 British soldiers, 
you know, Churchill called it a miracle of deliverance, and it is something that the British can celebrate. We got our soldiers home. Uh, you know, there's a great news article where they talk about the amount of just equipment left on the beaches and in Dunkirk. And it's massive, right? And they do sacrifice a number of regiments to protect Dunkirk. And you see that in the actual movie itself. But, you know, the, the British are going to get those soldiers back. And those are going to be the soldiers they need because when they go into Africa and when they go back into Europe, these are the soldiers that are going to form the core of that British army that's really going to give a, a good push in, you know, in 1944 and in 1945. Now, as the British are getting pushed out and pushed to the sea and then evacuated at Dunkirk, uh, the French army is being encircled. And that ultimately is going to be what happens to them. They're going to get completely encircled by the Panzer divisions. Um, you know, you get guys like Erwin Rommel really coming to their own at this. You know, France was made for kind of tank warfare, or at least that part of France is. Uh, when we get to the actual no Battle of Normandy in 1944, we'll talk about how that really didn't suit, suit some of the tanks at the time. But, you know, that, that northern French area kind of made for this, and they really pushed straight through. And the French are going to see massive amounts of surrenders as May turns into June. And that becomes ultimately what, what's going to happen. And Churchill is flying into France and meeting with the government. And the, the French government can't understand why Churchill has this whole no surrender mantra. Uh, because they're like, look, we need to surrender to Hitler before he destroys Paris, before he destroys everything. And I think that's a fun thing. Hitler doesn't bomb Paris. There's a threat to bomb Paris, but he doesn't. And Hitler did appreciate the artistic parts of Paris and everything else. We know Hitler has a strong art background. Um, but make no mistake, he would have bombed Paris that the French hadn't have surrendered, um, but more or less, they're going to try and save their country. And, and that's what they're they're kind of given. And, and a lot of times we look at the French surrender and people say, oh, the French just surrendered. The, the choices are simple. You could keep fighting and your entire country will be destroyed. The entire infrastructure. You know, you have soldiers. Every one of those soldiers' families are going to be homeless or killed, right? And the armies, you know, when Jeremy talks about, you know, not letting armies surrender, right? You're talking, you know, fighting to the last man. And while these things look really good in movies and they look really good when you talk about, oh, the Alamo or things to that nature, it's really hard to sell millions of people on that. And so a lot of people kind of say, okay, well, if Germany's just going to occupy us, you know, let's just end it. Let's just end the fighting. And then when Paris fell, right, on June 14th, when Paris fell, uh, that was a big time hit. That was a big time hit to the, to the French. And it's at that point when they are kind of, everything's all said and done. They kind of know that this war is going to be over. And we see a couple of major army groups surrender. Now, why are they surrendering? Because the Germans, instead of fighting that classic warfare where they got bogged down in trenches, you know, when they couldn't move any further, they called in the Luftwaffe, right? And they would have just massive bombing campaigns, or they would bring in panzers and overwhelm the defenses, or a combination of both, more than likely. And they had great artillery as well. And so the German army, again, very well trained, very well fought, very well funded at this time is going to go through and really execute uh, in the invasion of France. Now, as you kind of move forward from this, you know, France is, is going to surrender on June 25th, 1940. And so basically you're talking about a month and a half from the actual invasion of France. France is surrendering. And so in the United States, there is a panic you know, oh my God, like the world is coming to an end. You know, you have the Japanese who have been kind of attacking the Asian Pacific. And now you have, of course, the, the German army, which has taken over France and Britain looks to be on its knees. And so there's a big question for FDR. What do you do? Right. And we know what FDR is going to do. And some of the readings that if you're in my class that you're going to look at is the decision. Do we fund Great Britain's war? Do we become that arsenal of democracy is the term that we're going to see. And so so that's what you're going to see the United States respond with. You know, there's crazy incidents where, you know, Roosevelt can't actually give bombers to Britain. They have to take the bombers. They fly them to like Wisconsin and then they basically tow them across the border because they can't fly them into Canada for the British. Uh, there's also going to be a battleships for bases program where we're going to get some British naval bases in exchange for some battleships. And then eventually you're going to see the Lend-Lease Act, which we'll talk about in a different lesson uh, with, with U.S. mobilization, where the United States is going to lend large sums of money and then lease out military equipment, which basically is giving them military equipment. Um, and the British being one of the largest recipients of this uh, in the entire war, the largest recipient of this in the entire war. And so we're going to help fund that British counterattack and they're going to need it because the British are going to be struggling 
mightily kind of going forward. And we do know that Hitler is going to immediately, when they take over France, they divide France in half, right? Oh, oh we forgot. The Italians invaded France uh, right at the end of May and early June. And that ultimately is, is kind of just going to slam the door shut on any French resistance. Now, there is going to be some French resistance that does take place. You're going to have, obviously, uh, General Charles de Gaulle is going to escape. Uh, he's going to escape to England. And this is a guy who was mildly popular, not really that popular, but becomes extremely popular amongst the resistance people and vows to, to take back his home country. And he will. Uh, it'll be four years later when he marches through Paris. But he eventually does get there. We also see the French resistance start to form. But more specifically, we're going to see the French get divided up into an occupied territory, which is more or less the Atlantic seaboard, plus that northern French Paris area. And then we're also going to see the southern French, which could be called Vichy France, which is going to be the fascist in France running the country. And that ultimately is going to be uh, one of the, the big long lasting things because a lot of those Vichy French officials are going to get into a lot, a lot of trouble going forward. Um, but that kind of wraps it up for, for this, this lesson. I don't want to get into the Blitz of Britain just yet. Uh, that'll be probably next class along with the invasions uh, that Japan institutes in 1940, then eventually Pearl Harbor in 1941. But hope you enjoyed. Until next time, Mr. Arvitus, take it easy, guys.